and welcome to Jubilee Church's online service. My name is Alyssa and I'll be your host today. We also have other online hosts who would love to pray with you and answer any questions you may have. We have been living through a season of life unlike any other. The stats on people feeling stressed are not getting better, they're getting worse. This morning as we gather, we come to a God who understands, who sympathizes, and has rest for you. Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He gives rest, not just physical rest, not just mental rest, but rest for our soul. He provides relief to the deepest things in our life. And He is extending an invitation to you to come and receive from Him. So we sing songs today to Jesus because He is a God that lifts us up out of His goodness and His love for us.
all hope was gone And the lights went out And I wept all through the night Oh, I cried out for mercy Oh God, can you hear me? When I felt the weight as it crippled me and depression took its hold oh I cried out for mercy oh God can you hear me you lifted me on high brought me triumph in the night and turned my Your anger passed me by But your favor is for
grace and mercy I give thanks for how you heal me Oh God of grace and mercy I give you all We are so glad you are here. If you are new to our service, we appreciate you taking time out of your day to be with us. And we would like to give you a gift before you leave. To receive this gift, click on the link in your chat box and we will send one in the mail. One of the most exciting things to hear about is how God has changed someone's life. Recently, Renee Martin, one of our members, shared her story of what God has done in hers. After I had my son in August, he had a NICU stay to support his breathing. This wasn't what I expected, and anxiety began to rush in. Once we went home, most nights I got little to no sleep worrying about his health or my health. I began to feel depressed. My doctor said that I had postpartum depression and anxiety. Getting out of bed and doing daily chores that used to be a breeze were hard. I was desperate for God to break into my situation for my faith and trust to grow in God. One night I woke up and felt anxious, but fell back to sleep. I woke up again wondering what it was that was bothering me. I felt like at that moment, God told me to not worry about it and don't look back, but to focus on Him like Lot did as he was leaving Sodom. God also spoke to me about different possible ways to share my faith, which has helped me feel like my life had purpose again. Over the next several days, He filled me with joy and I slept well. Community has been so important during this time. Feeling heard and having others pray with me has helped me feel like I'm not alone in this trial. God is faithful. I'm trusting in Him to finish the healing that He has started and for Him to use this trial for my good and to bring Him glory. I know it's not a coincidence that we are going through this series right now. We are so excited to hear about what God is doing in your life, Renee. Thank you for sharing with us. Jubilee, Renee's story is such a good reminder of why we do what we do. It's why we give ourselves to loving others. The Bible says that God has a purpose for your life and it involves working through you to change people's lives. If you want to learn more, then join us for our online growth track. Growth track is a three-step course that happens over Zoom and our next class is November 7th. To sign up, click on the link in your chat box for more information on how to register. Don't forget to mark your calendars for two special events coming up. Women of Jubilee, the first one is just for you. We will gather at our Sunset Hills location and enjoy an evening in God's presence as we worship together. Please join us for our Ladies Worship Night on Friday, November 5th at 7 p.m. The second is for the whole church. We have a special opportunity to hear from guest speaker, Andrew Wilson. Andrew Wilson is an author and pastor that has been incredibly effective at equipping the church for ministry, and it will be a privilege to have him with us. Please join us Friday, November 12th at 7 p.m. Register by going to jubileestl.org. Well, you picked a great day to join our service because we are continuing in the series, Battle for the Mind, where we'll look at what the Bible has to say to us about mental and emotional health. In this season of constant change, isolation and uncertainty, depression can easily set in. We want you to know that you are not alone in this. Now would be a great time for you to click on the link in your chat box to invite a friend so they can benefit from this message as well. Now let's turn our attention to the scripture reading for today. Today's scripture reading is Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, 
or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days, the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. This is the word of the Lord. Have you seen it? It's been in my newsfeed for months. The great resignation is upon us. After the loss of roughly 14 million jobs during the COVID-19 pandemic, economists had predicted that workers would be returning to work in droves, that we'd have an amazing economic recovery. But this has not panned out. Instead, many Americans have opted to stay out of the workforce rather than return to their old jobs. When asked why they would prefer to remain jobless without benefits, many cited burnout as the primary reason for staying at home, despite having already been out of work and locked up for 22 months. How did things get this bad? Well, here is the opportunity for our obligatory statistics. 61% of workers surveyed stated that they felt burned out at work. In another poll, the same percentage, 60%, feel that the pandemic has affected their sleep patterns. And of those, 43% stated that they were so tired, so exhausted at work that it was affecting their ability to work safely. 48% of all employees in another poll feel both mentally and physically exhausted or worn out by the end of their workday. And that doesn't even include stay-at-home mothers with young children because they weren't polled. And then, as if widespread exhaustion wasn't enough, the World Health Organization reports an estimated 750,000 people die from work-related stress each year. That's three quarters of a million people losing their lives because they are overworked. A woman named Lisa who was interviewed in this article stated this when she was diagnosed with stress-related heart disease. Her response was this, I quote, I don't have time for this. I have projects due at work. The physical toll of our stressful lives is not the only challenge. We have unhealthy coping mechanisms as well. Alcohol and nicotine use, recreational use of marijuana, all of these are on the rise in the last 18 months. Substance abuse though isn't the only challenge. Many are acting out to relieve their stress. Last week we spoke about anger. Is it possible that your angry outbursts are a result of your exhaustion? What about your secret sins? I mean, isn't this an all too common headline? Celebrity pastor uh, ousted from their position because of sexual impropriety. Among a list of the top five reasons that people choose to use and abuse pornography is to relieve stress or deal with stress. We live in a culture of exhaustion and it is killing us literally and figuratively. According to a recent article on this topic, the author states this, in a time of increasing secularism, work remains our steadfast religion. But I beg to differ. People are staying home from work. They quit their jobs. They are losing even this most sacred American religion. Our pace of life has left us exhausted, overworked and unfulfilled. Our stress is leading us to abuse tobacco, alcohol, and even our own bodies. Isn't it interesting that despite living in a, a modern society where productivity is ever increasing and worker abuse protections are codified into law and we have a two-day weekend, we're still working ourselves to death. Why are we still so exhausted? Well, my name is Greg. I'm one of the elders in the city location. I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us uh, for this sermon series on uh, emotional and spiritual health and well-being. And today, I'm excited to show you from the scriptures how the biblical Sabbath offers you an antidote to your emotional, physical, and spiritual exhaustion. You see, the Sabbath was more than simply a mandated work stoppage. It was a radical, subversive act of rebellion against the world's values. A revolutionary practice from God to his people to help them overthrow idolatry and protect them from the corrosive values of the pagan cultures around them. 
to God. Rest is spiritual warfare. If we can grasp God's conception of the Sabbath and practice, I mean really practice the Sabbath in a faithful and a faith-filled manner, I am confident that our church can become an oasis of rest and peace in a desert of frenzy and despair. Now, God introduces the Sabbath to his people as part of the Ten Commandments. You might remember them from you know, uh, childhood, Sunday school classes. I think it's very instructive for us to look at these two verses, these two texts, when God introduces the Sabbath, because they each give us a different rationale for why we need rest. So the command to keep the Sabbath first appears in Exodus chapter 20. The text says this, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day, the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Here, God teaches us that our need for Sabbath rest is related to two foundational, transcendent, and ear refutable realities rooted in creation. First is part of our design. God made us in his image and God rested as part of his great creation opus. He also made us to be like him. So we should rest because we are like God and God chose rest. Now the second is closely related to this. God's people are meant to be a reflection of heaven on earth. A, a heavenly embassy, if you will. And so God, God was so satisfied with his work that he was able to rest. He was able to enjoy and partake of what he had created. We should reflect God to the world by showing them who he is and how he lives. We too should rest from our work and enjoy. Now the Ten Commandments, they show up again in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Here, God's command to the Sabbath is actually connected to a different rationale. Instead of appealing to his own pattern of rest, he appeals to the Israelites' experience of the Egyptian captivity. For 490 years, they were enslaved in Egypt. And he reminds them, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. The Exodus text teaches us this. If you aren't Sabbathing, you are enslaved. You are being abused and the perpetrator is you. Most Americans are legally free, but we are enslaving ourselves to unbiblical ideas of productivity. You are were designed for rest. The Deuteronomy text references both slavery and Egypt. So first, you were a slave. Remember your circumstance, God says. You were worked without rest. You had no control over your economic activity. You were at the mercy of a ruthless dictator who abused your body, robbed you of your produce, and denied you God-ordained rest. But not anymore, brothers and sisters. Are you living like an Egyptian slave even though you are free? But you say, I choose when I work and I get my paycheck every two weeks, okay? But why don't you feel free? Are you enslaved to productivity? Do you feel an unrelenting pressure to justify your existence? Are you obsessed with getting more done in less time? Are you so busy that you are refusing your body, your mind, and your spirit the rest and rejuvenation that they need? Second, you were in Egypt. Pharaoh is depicted as an unceasingly preoccupied individual, solely focused on the Israelites' productivity. When Moses suggests to Pharaoh that he allow God's people to, to go and to worship, to go and to Sabbath, Pharaoh's conclusion is, well, 
They aren't committed to their work. His only question is, why have they stopped working? And his only solution is, give them more work to do. If they had more work, they, they wouldn't have time to think about God, to think about rest, and to think about worship. And frankly, he's right. Modern Americans have fallen right into this trap, replicating for ourselves Pharaoh's same work ethos. Despite the fact that we are the wealthiest country in the world with the highest standard of living of any society ever on the planet, our culture largely views work the way that Pharaoh did. We are pathologically anxious that we won't achieve enough, won't have enough, or won't be enough. Now that's not to ignore the fact that hunger, homelessness, and financial ruin do exist, and many struggle with this. But on average, Americans work more, spend more, and consume more than anyone else. Yet we are more dissatisfied with our lives than previous generations of Americans were or that our contemporaries in other Western developed nations are. So when God tells the Israelites, you were in Egypt, but I brought you out, the proper question for us is, am I living with the Egyptian mentality or God's mentality? And this extends to all of us, not just the career types. You could be a gig worker. You could believe that grinding it out on your main job and your side hustle is going to offer you a material salvation that makes life worth living. Or you can be a stay-at-home mom and believe that making the home just the right way, doing enough dishes or doing the laundry and folding it properly, developing the right childcare routine, that will justify your existence. You could be a retired person and you can keep yourself busy managing your portfolio or pursuing your leisure in an attempt to make the most of your retirement and still be living in the hustle and bustle just like Pharaoh. Each of these approaches to busyness echoes the lies of Pharaoh that more work, more wealth, and more activity are the keys to our validation. And just as Pharaoh reasoned, what we have actually achieved is nothing more than a distraction from our true spiritual need. They say you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. Well, that's exactly what God did with the Israelites. He took them out of Egypt and he had them wander in the wilderness for 40 years so that he could take the Egypt out of the Israelites. You see, he gave them new laws, new values, new culture. He was creating a new people. And then he was ready to bring them into the promised land. So we start to see how the Sabbath and Sabbath obedience can be a blessing to us. According to God's own plan, keeping the Sabbath respects our design and delivers us out of the productivity meritocracy in our culture. First, in our practice through obedience, then in our minds as we think like God, and then eventually in our hearts as we come to love what God loves. But if God commands that we rest, something we all want, by the way, and God teaches that rest provides us the things we desperately need, why don't we do it? The reality is that much of our exhaustion, emotionally, physically, even spiritually, is self-inflicted. And in that way, it is a symptom of a deeper spiritual problem. You see, Pastor Tim Keller argues that the central question of human existence is one of justification. It can take many forms. Am I valuable? Am I lovable? Am I good enough? Does my life have meaning? When we try to answer these questions through our own effort, in our flesh, for ourselves, it leads to reasoning like this. Well, if I can accomplish this, then I will be good enough. Or if I can achieve that, then I will finally feel worthy. Then I can rest. In fact, sometimes we adopt other people's standards. If I could prove to my father that I'm a success, that I will finally be loved, or if I can win that person's affection, then I'll be whole. But this thinking still relies on us to achieve something. It is this relentless pressure to achieve what we cannot achieve that leads us exhausted. The exhaustion can be mental, emotional, physical, constantly scheming and racked with anxiety because we can't accomplish what we planned or 
so tired, so restless that uh, we making mistakes that, at work, so burdened that we feel hopelessness because we failed to achieve our goal. Or maybe we feel apathy because we actually do achieve the goal, but we still find ourselves empty. Ultimately, God's Sabbath offers us true rest from this dangerous spiritual cycle. In the gospel, we have a clear answer to the question, am I valuable? In Christ Jesus, God has shouted to us, yes, yes, you are valuable. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have paid the incomparable price to have you as my own. And then when we can finally rest in God, in his gospel, then he invites us to fill our days with eternally meaningful activity. But before we act, before we work, before we produce, we must first rest. Did you ever notice that the first full day that Adam spends on earth is a Sabbath? God made man on the evening of the sixth day and then Adam's first day alive is a day of rest with God. That's where we should start. That is God's desire for you. Before you go on a long trip, don't you fill your gas tank? Before you have a big day at work, don't you try to get a good night's rest? We need to rest before we work. Now that we've considered the spiritual and theological foundation for Sabbath, let's get practical. I used to believe that simply uh, explaining a spiritual truth was enough to help us. You know, the truth shall set you free. But what we need is to practice it. You see, the person who knows a lot about human physiology does not suddenly become fit. It's the person who puts on their tennis shoes and hits the streets, hits the gym. That is the person who is going to grow and become stronger. So let's practice together. Practically, how can Sabbath deliver us from our exhaustion? I thought of four, four things that need to be part of any Sabbath, and I would challenge you to incorporate these things into your life. First, cessation, then rejuvenation, celebration, and finally, restoration. First, cessation. You must stop working. That's pretty obvious. Our all hours of the day, phone in my hand, reach me at any time mentality is a special kind of destructive. But simply leaving the office isn't enough. You can leave the office and still have your mind filled with the tasks and the responsibilities of your day. So we have to stop thinking about work when we go on Sabbath. Now, you can also go home and stop thinking about work, but be so overwhelmed with the responsibilities of home that you can't rest there either. Trading our professional pressures for our domestic pressures is also not rest. So I recommend that, recommend that you set aside time in your week to stop even trying to be productive. In my home, this looks different for me and for my wife. So I can do laundry on the Sabbath because I don't do 15 loads of laundry every day. Doing laundry doesn't remind me of my work, my vocation, my everyday responsibilities. But my wife, well, her situation is different. And so we each need to find ways to break free from the typical cares, to say, no, I will not worry or think or scheme or plan or act because I trust that God is providing for me today and every day. Second, rejuvenation. Again, stopping work isn't enough. The point of stopping is to create space to do something spiritually meaningful, something rejuvenating, something that can fill us and fill our tank. So if your plan is to binge watch Netflix or uh, Hulu, well, let's admit, that usually leaves you more tired than rested. It's usually more of a distraction from your stress than it is a rejuvenating practice. My recommendation is that you do something spiritual, that you... You feed your spirit man, your spirit woman on the inside. Uh, you do something that draws you close to Jesus, the one who bought you and loves you. The Sabbath is meant to remind us that the anxieties of the world out there are small in comparison to the, the riches in here in Christ. And so we want to say with our words and with our thoughts and with our actions on the Sabbath, I have nothing to prove. I have nothing to accomplish. The great accomplishment of my life has been performed on my behalf by Jesus Christ. And we want to stay in that place 
of choosing to trust. But don't just be spiritual. Enjoy. God enjoyed the creation on the Sabbath day. He saw that it was good. He tasted and could see its goodness. So get out, ride a bike, throw a Frisbee, uh, lay in the grass, play a board game, read a book, watch a movie. Do something that is life-giving and rejuvenating. You can take time to enjoy. God made you a whole person and you should be whole on the Sabbath. Third, celebration. I have to say, this is my favorite part. Have you noticed that most Jewish feasts occur on a Sabbath? That is that in that day, the people reserved the best food, the best drink, the parties, the dancing, the singing, all these things to celebrate God's Sabbath. And you can too. Christians, we have the most to celebrate of any people in the world, yet we can often be the worst at this task. And so I invite you. In fact, God invites you. God commands you to celebrate on the Sabbath day. Cook that ribeye steak. Open that bottle of wine. Throw a party. Invite your friends. Do something great and honor God for his goodness, his glory, and his faithfulness to us on your Sabbath day. Whatever you do, celebrate God for his manifold blessings. You know, this was the... the the complaint against Jesus and his disciples. They said, Jesus, why is it that your disciples go around eating and drinking? The disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting. And Jesus said, can they fast when the bridegroom is with them? Jesus said, my presence is a wedding and you should all be celebrating. Last, restoration. Jesus was often challenged about his use of the Sabbath especially for healing on the Sabbath. But he stood on his authority as the Lord of the Sabbath. When the Pharisees tried to prevent a woman from being healed on the Sabbath, Jesus told them this. He said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound for 18 years, be loosed from her bonds on this day. There are a lot of ways to approach this aspect of Sabbath keeping, of, of doing justice, of restoring people. The first I would suggest is invest in relationships. Repair relationships. Seek forgiveness. Be a peacemaker. Especially consider those who are often overlooked. I think that the, uh, the elderly, the formerly married and the single among us often will work their week and have their connections, but on their Sabbath day, they may be alone. Their Sabbath day may be a day of pain and loneliness rather than a day of celebrating. Invite them in. Practice hospitality. But beyond that, the Sabbath, you know, the weekend, Saturday or Sunday, however you choose to, to spend it, that might be the perfect time for that neighborhood cleanup or for that um, soup kitchen outreach those are great times to do justice and, and bring God's justice to our city. Consider that as well as you build your Sabbath plan. In closing, I want to say a few things. You know, my wife and I, we've been ruminating on the Sabbath spiritually for about a year now. We've uh, recently used this four-point framework uh, that I've just shared with you to create a legit Sabbath plan for our family. Uh, we've only been doing it for a few weeks, but already we're seeing evidence of God's grace. Uh, we're more connected to one another. Uh, we're able to uh, disciple our children in the Lord better. Uh, we are finding true rest, even in the midst of uh, serious work and life challenges. And we are uh, feeling Jesus's presence in a way that we haven't in many months. And so I want to challenge you to do the same. Uh, we're going to end this series on spiritual and emotional health in about two more weeks. And you will have all of November, all of December to put a plan together and do it. Remember, knowing what the truth is, is not enough. Jesus says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You must first act, that is abide, draw near to Jesus in obedience. Then the truth will be revealed and then freedom will be released in your life. So together, I invite you 
God invites you. Let us build into our lives spiritual habits that will weather the storms, the storm of self-doubt, the storm of self-justification, so we can remind ourselves of the one who has spoken the final word over us about our worth and our value. That is Jesus.
it was great to have you with us today. We hope you'll join us again next week as we continue in our series, Battle for the Mind.